yesterday. I think it was the chapter, the secret riddle, chapter 13. Um, where um, actually we'll just pick up with pick up with chapter 15 kind of towards the end um, theory over here's Snape and Malfoy having a discussion. And he overhears the Snape saying that he made the unbreakable vow. And Snape is obviously trying to help Malfoy with something. Harry doesn't know what. And Malfoy is um, not going along with him. In fact, it's kind of interesting, excuse me, because... Whereas in, in all the previous books, Malfoy has only spoken glowingly glowingly of Snape and deferentially to him. This time he's he's got a bit of an attitude. Right? And we get to the end of that chapter, the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 16, and here he's talking with Ron. And Ron talks about how Fred and George tried to make him do an unbreakable vow. And uh, Harry says, well, what does it mean? This is the very first page of the chapter. Ron, well, you can't break an unbreakable vow. Harry, yeah, I worked that out on my own. What happens if you break it? You die. All right. And this is Christmas. In fact, I did go over this. Didn't I? This is Christmas at the Weasleys. And we see Rufus Scrimger come in. And he and Harry talk, and he wants Harry to essentially to be seen going in and out of the ministry, to make it look like he's actually um, helping the ministry. And Harry doesn't want to go along with that. And they, they part ways um, with a bit of animosity between them, because... Scrimger also wants to know what Dumbledore is doing when he leaves the school. Harry doesn't tell him. Harry doesn't know. But he also says, you're, thoroughly, you're Dumbledore's man through and through, aren't you? And Harry says, yes, glad, glad we straightened that out. But earlier in that chapter, and I think we talked about this last time we met, Harry wants to know. I talked about epistemology. Harry wants to know how they can trust Dumbledore, or more specifically, how they can trust Snape. And Lupin says, because we trust Dumbledore. Okay. Here at the end of the chapter, Harry says he's Dumbledore's man through and through, which means seems to imply he also completely, perfectly trusts Dumbledore. Yet it's clear he doesn't. And the next chapter is slug, Sluggish Memory, Harry has lessons with Dumbledore, and Harry tells Dumbledore about overhearing the conversation between Snape and, and um, Malfoy, and Dumbledore says, I, I need a particular memory. He needs a memory that um, Slughorn has. And he takes Harry into a memory, and Harry sees what happened to Morphin Gaunt. That Morphin got sent to Azkaban for a crime he essentially didn't commit. And Dumbledore says to Harry, right around page 365, 360, uh, sorry, 366, 367. He says, whatever Morphin was, he did not deserve to die as he did, blamed for murders he had not committed. Okay? Because what we see is that Tom Riddle, Tom Marvola Riddle, Voldemort, used Morphin's wand to commit murders. 
and implanted a memory in morphine. Okay? So that morphine was blamed for them. So that's when he tells Harry, I need this memory. I need this memory of Slughorns about when Tom Marvolo Riddle came and asked him about Horcruxes. All right. So we're going to skip a bunch. Uh, Harry and Ron get birthday surprises. Or Ron gets birthday surprises. They start to eat them. Ron gets poisoned. Harry saves Ron's mouth. Um, Go on to chapter 20, because we've got to get this book finished today. Chapter 20, Lord Voldemort's Request. Harry goes off for a lesson with Dumbledore, and Dumbledore asks, so have you gotten this memory yet? Harry, well, you know, what with Ron being poisoned, etc., etc., Dumbledore says, I understand. But then he does say also around page 427 or so. But once it was clear that Ron was going to be fine, he says, I would have hoped you would have returned to the task I set you. He emphasizes, we can't really do much more until we get this memory. It, this is how important it is. All right? So he takes Harry into another person's memory. But he does it after telling Harry that when Tom Riddle left um, Hogwarts, he went on to work for Borgen and Burks. He ended his period at Hogwarts kind of top of class. Excellent grades in all of his courses. People put him in contact with other people for good jobs, but he goes to work for essentially a pawn shop. And Harry's surprised at that. Dumbledore says, I think he had some reasons. Okay. And he talks about how important Hogwarts was or is to Voldemort. He says the school had been home for him. He felt that he belonged more here um, than anywhere else. He says, also, the stronghold is a castle, or is a stronghold of ancient magic. And Voldemort probably gained some of the secrets to the magic while he was a student, but he realized there was much more um, to be learned. Third, as a teacher, he would have power over students. Okay, Because he's talking about when Voldemort came back to ask to be a teacher when he was 18 but nobody would give him a job. Okay? So he goes on and works for Borgen and Burks. Harry asks, what job did he want? Defense against the dark arts. Okay? So he goes off to teach for, uh, to work at Borgen and Burks. And Dumbledore takes Harry into the memory of Hepzibah Smith. And we see Tom Riddle bargain with her, negotiate with her, for a couple of objects. Slytherin's locket and Hufflepuff's teacup. Teacup has the image of a badger on it. All right. Doesn't pay much for them. And then she's killed. So they come back out of the memory around 437 or 438. And Harry asks, okay, I understand why he wanted the locket. You know, it belonged to his ancestor, but, but why the cup? And Dumbledore says it belonged to another of Hogwarts founders. I think he still felt a great pull towards the school and that he could not resist an object so steeped in Hogwarts history. There were other reasons. And he says, and I'll demonstrate those to you in due course, meaning after you get this memory. Okay. So he takes Harry into another memory. This is one of Dumbledore's memories. Dumbledore sitting at his desk, knock on the door, and Voldemort enters. 
But it's not Voldemort as Harry remembers him. It's not Voldemort with the snake-like face. This is young, handsome. Tom Riddle Voldemort. Dumbledore asks him to sit down. Voldemort says, thank you. Says, I heard you'd been made headmaster, worthy choice. Dumbledore offers him a drink. And he says, so Tom, do what I do to what do I owe the pleasure? And he says, they don't call me Tom anymore. These days I am known as, and Dumbledore cuts him off. Why? He's not going to give him the opportunity to say what he is known as. Dumbledore is going to manage the conversation so that he will call Voldemort what he wants to call him by. But to me, I'm afraid you will always be Tom Riddle. It is one of the irritating things about old teachers, I am afraid, that they never quite forget their charges' youthful beginnings. It's almost as if, obviously not stated this way, but it's almost as if what Dumbledore is doing is he saying, sorry, Tom, but to me, you'll always be little Tommy Riddle. What he says is, they're youthful beginnings. What was his beginning with Voldemort? He was 11 years old. Okay. He raises the glass like he's toasting him. But here he notices, it's like the room suddenly got a bit chilly. Why? Because Dumbledore is not going to let Voldemort dictate the terms of the discussion. So Voldemort says, I'm surprised you've remained here so long. I mean, why did you never wish to leave the school? Dumbledore, well, you know, passing on ancient skills, etc., etc. Voldemort, still, I wondered. You, whose advice is so often sought by the ministry, and who has twice, I think, been offered the position of Minister of Magic. Dumbledore, three times at last count. So he's turned it down three times. He says, but yeah, I don't really want that. So Voldemort says, I have returned later perhaps than Professor Dippin expected, but I have returned to request once again what he was told I was too young to have. I have come to ask you, come to you to ask that you permit me to return to this castle to teach. I think you must know that I have seen and done much since I left this place. I can show and tell your students things they can gain from no other wizard. Dumbledore. Yes, I do certainly know that you have seen and done much since leaving us. Rumors of your doings have reached your old school, Tom. I should be sorry to believe half of them. Greatness inspires envy. Envy engenders spite. Spite spawns lies. You must know this, Dumbledore. What does he mean? Why does he say this? He's saying the rumors you've heard Caused by what? People are envious of my powers. They're envious of my greatness. Dumbledore, you call it greatness what you've been doing? Certainly. I have experimented. I have pushed the boundaries of magic further perhaps than they have ever been pushed. Okay? In modern college experience lingo or, you know, academic scholarship language, he has pushed the limits of scholarship. I mean, that's what scholars are supposed to do. They're not supposed to just simply pass on. They're supposed to push the boundaries. Dumbledore, of some kinds of magic, Tom, of some. Of others, you remain, forgive me, woefully ignorant. What kinds of magic is Tom Riddle talking about? Yeah, the dark arts. He says... I've pushed those. And Dumbledore says of others, you're ignorant, not knowing. And for the first time, Voldemort smiles. Almost a leer. And he says, the old argument. You get the impression this is something they've discussed many, many times. But nothing I have seen in the world has supported your famous pronouncements that love is more powerful than my kind of magic. Okay. Love. Notice, nothing I have seen in the world. Well, what has he seen in the world? 
Evil? Is that all he's seen? But what's he been doing? He's been pushing this. What did he experience at the orphanage? Did he experience love? Loneliness. Bullying. Bullying. He was doing it. Abandonment. Abandonment. My mother couldn't have been magic because she died. Right. Where is he looking? Notice what Dumbledore says. Perhaps you've been looking in the wrong places. Old Stephen or Ellen Bishop song. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in all the wrong faces. Where's he been looking? Outside. Christ says the kingdom of heaven is inside. It's in the heart. That you must descend into the heart. Right? Did Voldemort experience love for Mrs. Cole? No. He has experienced love. He's just not aware of it. Where did he experience it? Dumbledore. Yes. Did Dumbledore have to come offer him a place at Hogwarts? No. no, he did not. And he does. Does he know what kind of student Tom Riddle is when he goes to him? Yeah. He knows he's already a bully. Right? He doesn't put two and two together. You know, Harry asked him, did you know then? And Dumbledore finishes. Did I know then that I looked at the one who would grow up to be the most powerful dark wizard ever? No. Okay. What's Harry thinking? If you knew then he was going to be what he is now, not only would you have invited him, but would you have killed him? I asked my students last night because some reporter has asked this of some political candidates. If you could go back in time and kill baby Hitler, abort Hitler in the womb, would you? Jim Bush said, yeah, in a heartbeat. Ben Carson said, no, because I'm against abortion. But think of what the question really implies. I'm a person. I'm a person. It's, kind of, kind of, it's a personal opinion. Okay, it's personal opinion, but what else? That person could have changed. Baby Hitler in the womb was not Adolf Hitler who starts the Holocaust. What had to happen between being born and starting the Holocaust? It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. You know? Think about this for a moment. I mean, a little thought experiment. I don't know if you've ever seen, but look up on the internet, you know, Hitler's paintings. Hitler tried to get into an art school, a conservatory for painters. He was denied entrance because they said his skill wasn't good enough. Look at the paintings he painted. They're fantastic. Look at his drawings. I mean, he painted and drew an awful lot. He was a very accomplished artist. Here's the thought experiment. What would have happened if he'd been accepted? Would he have become one of the most famous painters of the 20th century? And not. The founder of the Nazi movement? Obviously, there's no way to know, okay? So, Voldemort, uh, Dumbledore, perhaps you've been looking in all the wrong places. Dumbledore doesn't say, Tom, I've shown you love. But he has. Gives him a place at the school and such. Well, then, what better place to start my fresh researches than here at Hogwarts? Notice, what is he suggesting? Love for Tom Riddle is what? It's an academic discipline. What did Dumbledore say about love in the 
Department of Mysteries at the Ministry of Magic. He says there's a room in the Department of Mysteries whose door is always locked. Why is that door always locked? You know, in the brain room, you can go in. The space room, you can go in. The time room, you can go in. The death room, you can go in. Why not love? Dumbledore says it has a power that is greater than any power of nature. It has a power that is greater than any idea. What's he mean? It's not something to be studied. What is love? It's something to be experienced. It's something to be given. All right? Will you let me share my knowledge with your students? I place myself, my talents at your disposal. I am yours to command. Dumbledore, and what will become of those you command? Those Death Eaters. Oh, you know of my friends. Okay. And Dumbledore goes on to reveal, yeah, I know that your friends are at the hogshead right now. You are omniscient as ever. No, just friends with the local barman. So he says, come on, Tom. Tell me why you're really here. What do you want? I, I, I want the job. I do want to teach it very much. No, you don't. You want to come, by, come back to Hogwarts. You don't want to teach any more than you wanted to when you were 18. So what are you after? Why not try an open request for once? It's kind of interesting. I never thought about this before. But here he begins a question to Voldemort that exact same way at the end of the seventh novel. When he's offering... Dumbledore, his shot, uh, Voldemort, his shot at redemption. Voldemort sneers. If you don't want to give me a job, of course I don't. And I don't think for a moment you expected me to. Yet you came here, so you must have had a purpose. This is your final word? Dumbledore says it is. And then what did Dumbledore say? He says, the time is long gone when I could frighten you with a burning wardrobe and force you to make repayment for your crimes. But I wish I could, Tom. I wish I could. Notice, I can't force you. Why not? Could Dumbledore literally force Voldemort at this age? Yeah, he could. So what does he mean? Think of the chapter. Will and won't. <laughs> he won't. Why not? The student. I mean. Okay. What would that take away from Voldemort? His free will. His free will. His choice. But I wish I could. He wishes he could so that he could, you know, protect others and such. So we get the unknowable room. Um, Terry's trying to figure out where Malfoy keeps going. I'm going to skip that. After the burial, Aragog dies, Hagrid breaks down, and he goes with Hagrid and Slughorn to bury Aragog, and he uses the Felix Felicis, the good luck potion, on Slughorn. They're both drunk, Hagrid and Slughorn, so that helps. And he gets Slughorn to reveal the memory, but he does it by appealing to Slughorn's memory of Lily. And he says, last couple pages. Harry says, I am the chosen one. I have to kill him. I need that memory. Slughorn, you are the chosen one? Of course I am. And then Harry says, be brave like my mother, Professor. You know, she died trying to save me. Slughorn, I'm not proud. I'm ashamed of what, of what that memory shows. I think I may have done great damage that day. Harry, you cancel out anything you did by giving me the memory. 
would be a very brave and noble thing to do. So Slughorn gives him the memory and we get chapter 23, Horcruxes. Harry immediately runs up to Dumbledore's office. It's midnight. <coughs> and so we see Slughorn's memory. Around page 496 is where he starts to discuss Horcruxes. A horcrux is the word used for an object in which a person has concealed part of their soul. Tom Riddle's like, but I don't understand how it works. Well, you know, you split your soul, you see. You hide part of it in, a, in an object outside the body. Yeah, but how would you do that? Slughorn. Well, you must remember, the soul is supposed to remain intact and whole. Splitting it is an act of violation. It's against nature. Yeah, but how do you do it? Well, an act of evil, the supreme act of evil, by committing murder. Why is murder the supreme act of evil? Why is it more evil than rape? You're taking someone's life. Murder is actually all three unforgivable curses bound up into one. Great pain? The imperious? <laughs> yeah, you are taking away their will. You are taking their way, away their ability to choose. You are taking away their sense of self. And then obviously death. Okay? So, Tom Riddle keeps asking him, yeah, but if you can encase yourself in one horcrux, you know, I can see how that would be powerful. But the most powerful number is seven. Wouldn't it be better to do it in seven things? And Slughorn just can't imagine that. Okay? And then Dumbledore brings Harry out of the memory, and they start to talk. And Dumbledore starts to explain. The diary had been a horcrux. And Harry says, I don't understand. Dumbledore, well, it worked as a horcrux is supposed to work. It concealed a fragment of soul, which Harry talked to. Okay? And he says, don't you remember at the end of... Goblet of Fire, you told me that Voldemort said to his followers, you know, he says, that I have gone further than anybody along the path that leads to immortality. He says, that's what you told me at the time. Further than anybody. He was referring to his horcruxes, Harry. Horcruxes in the plural. He'd done more than one. Harry, so he's made it impossible to kill him? By murdering other people? They keep talking. Dumbledore replays the part, or brings back the part about seven being the most powerful, powerful magical number, and Harry says he made seven horcruxes, which means he had to kill seven people. Dumbledore, no, I don't think so. I think he only made six. The seventh part <laughs> resides within himself. Dumbledore's wrong. He does make seven, and then there's one more, the one that still resides in himself. All right, so they keep talking, and Harry says, okay, <laughs> okay, so there's only six horcruxes. How are we supposed to find them? They could be anywhere. He says, no, you've destroyed one, and I've destroyed one. Harry, you have. Dumbledore, bitch, it's the rig. Okay, so there are four more. And Dumbledore says, what did he give up to destroy the Horcrux? His hand. A withered hand does not seem an unreasonable exchange for a seventh of Voldemort's soul. Okay, so he sacrificed. So it, Harry's like, okay, so four more. It's still, how are we going to find these? And Dumbledore brings Harry back to the discussion of trophies that we talked about the other day. Voldemort has collected trophies. Okay. And here he says, the locket, the cup. Very good. So those probably are two more. And then Dumbledore says, he probably wanted something from Slytherin. He probably wanted something from Ravenclaw and Gryffindor. But he says, the only known relic of Gryffindor remains safe. What does Dumbledore mean? What is the only known relic of Gryffindor? 
the sword. But that's not true. Sorting Act, very first song, says, Gryffindor whipped me off his head, and they each put some of their brains inside. The Sorting Act belonged to Godric Gryffindor. That makes it a relic of Godric Gryffindor. The fact that they each put some of their brains inside then means it's also a relic of each of them. Okay? So, Dumbledore keeps talking and he says, I think the snake is a horcrux. And he concludes by telling Harry, he doesn't really conclude, but he says, I think he intended to make a horcrux out of killing you. I'm sure that he was intending to make his final horcrux with your death, but he failed. Harry says, okay. So the diary's gone, the ring's gone, so two are gone. So that means the cup, the locket, and the snake are still intact. And you think there might be a horcrux that was once Ravenclaw's or Grifters? Dumbledore says yes. Harry, so you still looking for him? Is that where you go when you leave? Yes. Harry, does Voldemort know when a horcrux is destroyed? I mean, can he feel it? Like, does he shudder, feel weak? And Dumbledore says, not quite <coughs> sure. <coughs> they keep talking, and Harry says, okay, so if all the Horcruxes are destroyed, then Voldemort can be killed. Yes, I think so. But Dumbledore says, but even then, he'll still be very powerful. His horcruxes don't make him more powerful. They don't make him less powerful. So you, you'd still have to deal with Voldemort the wizard, Harry, or Dumbledore. It will take uncommon skill and power to kill a wizard like Voldemort. But I haven't got uncommon skill and power, Harry says. Dumbledore, you have a power that Voldemort has never had. He's like, oh, great. You're going to tell me I can love again. Yes, Harry, you can love. Which, given everything that has happened to you, is a great and remarkable thing. Well, what's everything that has happened to Harry? Compare Voldemort's 11 years at the orphanage with Harry's 10 years with the Dursleys. How different are they? What does Mrs. Cole say she at least tries to do with the children at the orphanage twice a year? They take them on an outing. They go to the sea or they go to the countryside. We're told when Harry goes off to the zoo with Dudley on his birthday, that's the first time Harry has ever gotten to accompany them on one of those outings. He's almost 11. He's been with them for 10 years. He's never gone on an outing to the countryside or to the ocean. So when the prophecy says, I'll have the power, the Dark Lord knows not, it just means love. Yes, just love. Harry, never forget that what the prophecy says is only significant because Voldemort made it so. See, Harry still hasn't bought into that. What does Harry think about the prophecy? The prophecy, for, in Harry's mind, is akin to what? Fate. It's written in stone. It's like, you know, the prophecy that Oedipus hears in Oedipus the king. Right? His parents were told when his mother was pregnant with him, the one in your womb will kill your husband and marry you. So, as soon as he's born, they give him to a servant. They have the servant nail his ankles together and to take him out and put him on a mountain and expose him to the elements so that he'll die. The servant does that, but another messenger comes by and they feel sorry for the kid, so the other person takes the child he goes off to live in another country. He grows up. He hears a prophecy. You are fated to kill your father and lie with your mother. He loves his father and mother. He doesn't want to do either of those things. So he runs away. 
When he runs away, he comes to a crossroads where a man won't let him cross the road. And so he kills him. The man just happens to be old enough to be his father and kind of looks a little bit like him. He keeps going down that road. He comes to the city whose king has just been killed. He solves the riddle of the Sphinx and his reward is he gets the queen who just happens to be old enough to be his mother and looks a little bit like him. So in attempting to run away from fate, he causes fate to happen. That's what Harry thinks prophecies do. In other words, there's no escaping them. Okay? What's Dumbledore say? Voldemort singled you out as the person most dangerous to him. He made you the person most dangerous to him. Harry, but it comes to the same. Dumbledore, no it doesn't. You are setting too much store by the prophecy. But if Voldemort had never heard the prophecy, would it have been fulfilled? If Voldemort had never heard the prophecy at all, would he have gone off looking for Harry Potter? No, he wouldn't. So would he have then created Harry Potter? No, he wouldn't. Would it have meant anything? Of course not. Harry, but last year you said one of us has to kill the other. Only because Voldemort made a grave error. What was the error? It's not only that he acted on Trelawney's words. How much of the prophecy did he hear? Only the first part. The one born of those who have thrice defied you will be born at the end of the seventh month. And he will kind of be your enemy. Voldemort heard that part. He didn't hear the part. And you will mark him as your equal and give him the power to destroy you. If Voldemort heard that part, then he would kind of go, hmm, if I mark him as his equal and give him the power to destroy me, then maybe I should leave him alone. But he doesn't hear that part. If Voldemort had never murdered your father, would he have pardoned you if your desire for revenge? Of course not. If he had not forced your mother to die for you, would he have given you a magical protection? Of course not. Don't you see? He created his worst enemy. He heard the prophecy, leapt into action, with the result that he not only handpicked the man, most likely to finish him, he handed him uniquely deadly weapons. What's Harry's response? But what's Harry keep coming back to? I kill him, he kills me. Okay. So, Dumbledore says, By attempting to kill you, Voldemort himself singled out the remarkable person who sits here in front of me and gave him the tools for the job. It's Voldemort's fault you were able to see into his thoughts, his ambitions, that you even understand the snake-like language in which he gives orders. And yet, despite all that, Harry, you have never been seduced by the dark earth. Never, even for a second. Harry, of course I haven't. He killed my mom and dad. So, you are protected, in short, by your ability to love. The only protection that could possibly work against the lure of power like Voldemort's. Notice, love is the only protection against the lure of power. How so? How does love express itself? Is it all about me? No. Love is all about the other person or other people. It's not about self-protection. It's about protection of others. It's not about my desires, my wants. It's about other people's desires and wants. He says, with all the temptation you have endured, with all the suffering, you remain pure of heart. Just as you were at the age of 11 when you stared into a mirror that reflected your heart's desire and it showed you only the way to thwart Voldemort and not immortality or riches. 
Harry, do you have any idea how few wizards could have seen what you saw in the mirror? But now Voldemort knows that. Okay? Harry, but it all comes down to the same thing, doesn't it? I've got to try and kill him or... Double or latches on those two words. Got to? Like you're being forced? Of course you got to. But not because of the prophecy. Because you yourself will never rest until you've tried. We both know it, Harry. He says, imagine. Imagine you knew nothing about the prophecy. How would you feel about Voldemort? And we're told a flame seemed to leap inside his chest. Why? Because he thinks of Cedric Diggory. He thinks of his father and his mother and Sirius. And he thinks of all the terrible things Voldemort has done. In other words, what is he thinking of? Revenge. Is it revenge? Maybe avenging? Yeah. There's a difference between revenge and avenging. <laughs> When he thinks of his parents, and he thinks of Cedric, and he thinks of Sirius, what's he thinking? Is he thinking only of the dead? No. He's also thinking of those living who might become the dead. No. If Voldemort isn't stopped, what happens? If Isis isn't stopped, what happens? More parasites. More airliners, the Russians admitted today. That airliner that was brought down over the Sinai, it was a bomb. Smuggled by ISIS. Okay. You haven't even heard about this one, probably. Two Shia mosques in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, were bombed last week. The day before, what happened in Paris? 43, 45, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was 45 killed. ISIS. Okay. If they're not stopped, what happens? Like every cancer, it grows. Okay. What's Harry thinking about? And yeah, I can stop it. I can stop it. So that no other child grows up without his parents. So that nobody else has to grieve like Harry did over Cedric or over Sirius. I'd, I'd want him finished, and I'd want to do it. But Dumbledore, of course you would. You see, the prophecy does not mean you have to do anything. But the prophecy caused Lord Voldemort to mark you as his equal. In other words, but you have the ability to. Wanting to stop ISIS and stopping ISIS Two totally different things, right? Does the United States want to stop ISIS? We say we do. What are we doing? Yeah, I'm agreeing. I'm with you on that. What are the French doing? The French are pissed. No. The French are kind of, the French are very much like the United States. It takes an awful lot to get us up off our sorry asses. But once you do. The, the French are much less merciless, more merciless than the United States tend to be. If you really attack the French, it, it won't be like you know the first Gulf War, where we march into Kuwait, we get the Iraqis out, we start to chase them down the bag, the highway to Baghdad, etc., and then stop. No. They don't finish until they're done. He marked you as his equal. In other words, you are free to choose your way. What could Harry do, Dumbledore says? You could turn your back and you could move to San Diego, Harry. But what's Voldemort going to do? He's going to follow you. He's going to look for you. He will continue to hunt you, which makes it certain really that, that one of us is going to end up killing the other, says Harry. In other words, he gets it at this point. And look at the paragraph that Rowling describes us as. 
He understood at last what Dumbledore had been trying to tell him. And rolling gives us a metaphor. It was, he thought, the difference between being dragged into the arena to face a battle to the death and walking into the arena with your head held high. What is he talking about? What arena? This is an image from history. It applies to one group of people. Christians and the Colosseum. Christians during the Roman persecutions. And we have hundreds of accounts of these martyrdoms. And there are some where the Christians are dragged, kicking and screaming. Why? They don't want to be eaten alive by lions and tigers and bears. They don't want to be slowly battered to death by gladiators. But by far, the vast majority of these accounts of Christian martyrdom is of people walking into the arena or into the Colosseum, head held high, chest thrust out, welcoming death. Why? Because they're not afraid of it. They're not afraid of it. Some people perhaps would say there was little to choose between the two ways. Meaning, whichever way you go into the arena, drag kicking and screaming, or walking in of your own free will, head held high, you both end up what? Dead. But what's Harry's point? It's how you face it that's important. It's not that you're going to die. Everybody dies. Absolutely everybody dies. It's how you face death. It's how you're prepared for death. What does nearly headless Nick tell Harry? Sirius won't come back. Why? He will have gone on. Because he was prepared. He wasn't afraid to die. Nearly headless Nick was afraid to die. Why didn't Cedric come back? Because he had a well-organized mind. Cedric knew what was important. What was important? To be just, to be true, to be loyal, to be honest, to be a hard worker. That's why Dumbledore says, if you ever have the chance to do the right thing or the easy thing, Remember Cedric. He did the right thing. He didn't reach for a cup. That would have been the easy thing to do. He still would have ended up dead, notice. Either way. Okay? But Harry knew, and Dumbledore knew, thought Harry, with a rush of fierce pride, and so did my parents, that there was all the difference in the world. How you approach death is the most important thing. Which is why I argue, I mean, all these books are about one thing. They're all about the art of dying well, of the good death, of accepting I must die. Okay? Because ultimately, that's what Voldemort cannot do. Why is Voldemort so afraid of death? We're never told. We're never told that Voldemort thinks you die and then you just dissipate and you are no more. Or whether he thinks you die and then you get punished. We don't know what Voldemort thinks. All we know is that if that door represents death, Voldemort is going to be as far away from it as he possibly can. Meanwhile, Dumbledore is just kind of sitting there with his hands on that. He's ready. He's not afraid of it. Like Socrates says, death isn't something to be feared. It's merely the great unknown. But everyone in this room will go out this door 
in about 30 minutes, if not before then. And you're not afraid of what's out there, are you? It's unknown. I mean, literally, it is unknown. How can I mean that? You can't predict the future. You think you know what's going to happen when you go out the door. Why? Right, exactly. Because of previous experience. Okay. Go back to the conversation with Lupin at Christmas. Harry wants to know. Lupin says, we trust Dumbledore. Why do they trust Dumbledore? Because he's never failed us in the past. Okay. But for Harry, that's not good enough. He wants to know. If you want to know that you'll be safe going outside this door, what can you do? Nothing. Nothing. But instead, you believe you'll be safe. 90% of life probably is belief. It's not knowing. You go out the store thinking you'll be safe. Why? Because you did yesterday. And the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that. You buy tickets, you go to a rock concert. Because you've done it before, and you've done it before, and you've done it before. But if you went to the Bataclan venue in Paris Friday night, guess what? All those prior years of experience didn't mean shit. Because either you got shot, or you got killed, or you witnessed a lot of people getting shot and killed. Who had all, every one of them, been to concerts before. And on the basis of those prior experiences, they went out for a good time that night. Okay? Were they prepared? Like Harry is thinking about here? I have no idea. But that's what Rowling is suggesting. We must be prepared. None of us knows when we're going to die. None of us knows when some whack job is going to attempt to kill us. Or somebody is going to run a red light and you get in a car accident. Okay? She seems to be suggesting, therefore, we need to think about this. Very next chapter, Sectum Sempra. What happens? Um, Harry goes off. He sees Malfoy. He's in the, the bathroom, and Malfoy's talking with Moni Myrtle. And this is around page uh, 511, I think. He hears Malfoy say, no one can help me. His whole body's shaking. I can't do it. I can't. It won't work. And unless I do it soon, he says, I'll kill me. And Harry realized with a shock so huge, it seemed to ruin him to the spot. Malfoy was crying, actually crying. Tears streaming down his pale face into the grimy basin. Malfoy gap, gulp, then with a great shudder, he looks up into the mirror and he sees Harry. He wheels around. Harry does leather corpus. Malfoy blocks the jinx. And then Harry does septum sempra. Blood spurted from Malfoy's face and chest as though he had been slashed with an invisible sword. He staggers backwards. No, gasps Harry. Harry gets to his feet, goes towards Malfoy. No, I didn't. Malfoy saying something. Harry doesn't know what. Moni Myrtle yells out, murder, murder. Okay. He finishes the previous chapter thinking about what death means, and then he nearly kills Malfoy. Why? Because he didn't know what Sectum Semper did. He just thought of the first thing that came to his mind. 
Snape tells Harry to wait. Snape comes back and then mentions uh, the school books. Harry takes the potions book out. Okay. And Harry goes on and talks to Hermione, page um, about 528, I think. And he says, you know I wouldn't have used a spell like that, not even on Malfoy. But you can't blame the prince. He hadn't written. Try this out. It's really good. Okay. And he tells Hermione he's going to keep using the book. Ginny, by the sound of it, Malfoy was trying to use an unforgivable curse. You should be glad Harry had something good up his sleeve. Okay. Ron wins the Quidditch World Cup. We get the seer overheard. Um, and here he goes off for a lesson with Dumbledore, 546. And Dumbledore says, I think there's a Horcrux hidden in a cave. They keep talking, and Dumbledore asks, what's, what's going on? Harry, nothing. What's upset you? I'm not upset. Harry, you were never a good Aquamans. Harry says, Snape. Snape's what happened. He told Voldemort about the prophecy. It was him. He listened outside the door. Trelawney told me. When did you find out? Just now. And you let him teach here. And he told Voldemort to go after my mom and dad. What's Harry doing? Snape told Voldemort, my parents are dead. It's Snape's fault. Dumbledore says, Professor Snape made a terrible mistake. He was still in Lord Voldemort's employ on the night he heard, heard the first half of the prophecy. Okay. You have no idea the remorse he felt when he realized how Voldemort had interpreted the prophecy. And Harry asks, how can you be sure Snape's on our side? I am sure. I trust Severus Snape completely. What could Dumbledore do at this point? If you've read book seven, he could explain why. What has Snape done? It's because of what happened to Harry's parents that Snape becomes a double agent. Okay. Harry goes on to talk about Malfoy. That he's up to something. Dumbledore says, you know my views on this matter, blah, 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 blah. So Dumbledore takes him off to the cave. But he makes Harry promise, you must obey me. You must do whatever I tell you. Okay? So they get to the cave. Dumbledore drinks the potion, and he starts to have these visions. We're not told what Dumbledore sees. Okay? As he drinks the potion, he starts to cry out. This is um, 571 or so. Dumbledore cries out, it's all my fault, my fault. I know I did wrong. Please make it stop. I'll never, ever. He keeps drinking. Please, no, not that, not that. Dumbledore, you know, next page. Kill me. They leave, they come back to the school, they see the dark mark. And Dumbledore tells Harry to go get Snape as they make their way to the astronomy tower. Okay. Malfoy shows up, but Dumbledore before he, Harry can leave, freezes Harry. Where Harry can't be seen, he's under his invisibility cloak. Notice how different this is if you've seen the film. How different this is from the film version. The film version is utterly idiotic. Because Harry isn't under his invisibility cloak, and he's not been frozen. And what we have is Snake comes up and goes, Shh, give this a secret between us. 
So that Harry essentially sees Snape kill Dumbledore and doesn't raise a finger to stop him. Well, he doesn't raise a finger to stop him because he can't. Okay? So Dumbledore essentially begs Snape, Severus, please, please. Okay? After all the stuff with Draco, which we'll come back to when we do book seven. And Snape kills Dumbledore. Jump to essentially the end. I mean, there are other points I could talk about, but I won't. What happens when Snape kills Dumbledore and leaves? What do McGonagall, Lupin, Hagrid, the Weasleys, and all the others think? Basically. Okay. okay. What do they think about Snape? We were wrong all along. Dumbledore was wrong. In other words, Harry, you were right for wanting to know. Okay. They all assume Snape killed Dumbledore. Therefore, Snape must be bad. Do they know any of them? About the unbreakable vow? No. Snape does. Dumbledore does. Harry overheard Snape talk about it with Malfoy. But do Lupin or McGonagall or Hagrid or any other members of the Order of the Phoenix, do any of them know about Snape's secrets, let's say, with Dumbledore? Nope. Okay. So... We trust Dumbledore. Lupin makes everything, in terms of Harry's belief system, let's say, rest upon that. Dumbledore was wrong about Snape. So that creates kind of a, a almost a virus in Harry that says, okay, if Dumbledore was wrong about Snape, what else is he wrong about? And that's like I said, it's like a virus that starts of Dumbledore. So that when we begin book seven, Harry's now full of doubt. Okay? It's like he doesn't know Dumbledore. But go back to my you know, thing about the door and about your fear of the unknown doesn't stop you from going out. Why? Because you went out yesterday. Harry has six years of experience with Dumbledore. And he's going to let, kind of like one day, overshadow all six years. Um, turn to... Chapter the White Tomb. Actually, no, we'll stop there. I might make some comments about that chapter um, on Thursday, but I, I don't want to get into it right now. All right, we'll just stop there.